Welcome to In the Deep. I'm your host, Catherine Ingram. The following is excerpted from Dharma Dialogues, held in April 2017 in Byron Bay, Australia. It's called Letting the Tears Flow. One of my friends called today and in a casual, breezy way said, what you've been doing. And I said, well, right now, um, I'm laying on my couch, listening to the bird song. I'm watching an orange butterfly outside my window and talking to you. But what I didn't get into with him was the previous few hours of the day whereby I had woken up to the news that one of my very close friends of 40 years has just uh, learned that he has only 30% of his kidney functioning. It's a pretty serious situation he has. Another one of my friends died yesterday. Um, That was also part of the news of the morning. And someone who had been coming to Dharma Dialogues and retreats for 20 years. Uh, And then I had a bureaucratic snafu, which I was telling a couple of people here. Uh, And then I went to Richmond Gravel and Landscaping in Ballina to tromp around in a gravelly kind of place and pick out flagstones and such. So you can imagine that when I was back home, laying on the couch, looking at the butterfly and listening to the bird song and talking to my dear friend in California, you might imagine the kind of uh, heightened experience that that might be, right? Heightened in terms of its sweetness, And it's like that, isn't it? It's sort of, especially as you get older, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of loss. And it's kind of just, I've I've described it recently as, it's like a popcorn popper. You know, when you're young, it's like when the popcorn is just a couple of, you know, one here and one there and one there. And then... (laughs) You know, as you're getting older, it's like... (laughs) But then it does slow down at the end. (laughs) So... (laughs) I'm in one of those phases of the... uh, (laughs) The popcorn is really (laughs) popping. And so, those moments... And there are many... And I'm really getting the hang of appreciating them, I must say. Um, Especially living here, where it's so beautiful and where you actually can tune into nature, which is such a privilege. And which, as it turns out, I just read this past week, there's all these interesting studies that are just coming out. It's going to be totally intuitive what I'm about to say, but now there's actually a lot of science backing it. That the sounds of nature literally... um, they like bump up your immune system. You can actually reverse things by just even playing sounds of nature in the evening. If you're not, if you don't happen to be in nature, it'll even have an effect. P- playing bird song on a on a you know on a device, it'll actually have a soothing, calming effect, and and it's very very healthy for you. So in, this, in these moments while I was laying there with my friend on the phone, in my awareness was all the rest of it of the day and the, especially the images of the friend who had died because his wife sent out photographs. And 
it was all there at once. It was all there, it was all included. See, sometimes in spiritual scenes, there's a hope for escape from feeling the sorrow, right? Or some, you think there might be some kind of philosophy that lets you off the hook. You know, there's a catch that you get, you get to be spared. But what if, really, you have to face it in a raw way? You have to just let it through, let it break the heart, let the tears come, let, let yourself feel it all. And in that kind of tenderness, let yourself really have those moments with the butterfly and the kind word. Another part of the day was the incredibly lovely and helpful young man who helped me at the gravel place (laughs) and who seemed so willing to like haul these big heavy flagstones out to look at them and I kept saying, oh, that's really heavy. Are you sure you're okay? You know, just all those moments that you have with people, perfect strangers, where, you know, it's, it's just self unto self, right? You can sense that there's deep empathy. He even said to me at one point, point, I like to think of all those kinds of projects, meaning landscaping projects, as my project too. And I loved that. To do work when you do an offering in your life, that you do it with that kind of of intention. So one becomes susceptible to feeling the very difficult stuff. The more awake you get, the more sensitive you become. You feel it all. And yet you're also very susceptible to the sweetness. You become more and more like a clearing that things are just breezing through. Okay. So. If anyone has anything you'd like to discuss on these matters or similar matters, please feel free. I read something this week. Um, before enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water. And after enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water. <laughs> yeah. And I just wanted to ask you um, what you, if you could relate to that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not only can I relate to it, in 1982, I was the research assistant for the book called Chop Wood, Carry Water. <laughs> <laughs> written by Rick Fields. <laughs> but, but it was basically a compilation of, of um, Dharma bits. Um, and the title of the book was Chop Wood, Carry Water. <laughs> so yes, I can relate to it. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not a believer in this concept of enlightenment and a before and after. But, um, uh, but the point is that that... It comes down to ordinary life, whereby you're you're doing the ordinary things, right? You're showing up in the ordinary ways. There you are at the grocery store. There you are at the gravel pit. 
<laughs> there you are sitting in a, you know, a beautiful hall having Dharma conversation, right? There you are in all these different contexts um, that you bring your awareness to each and every circumstance, you know, that it becomes a Dharma life. That's another thing that people get muddled about is they that some categories of life and some activities they consider spiritual and then the rest of it is just throwaway or something <laughs> but but when there's a recognition of of the truth of things then that brightness of being is with you throughout all your activities, or let's say most of them. Yeah, I've noticed um, over the last few weeks, uh, along with the broken heart that I feel, is um, that sensitivity that you talk about. Um, um, I can't believe how many times I'm bursting into tears and just, you know, when I see something like on the news or hear of something, <laughs> I can, f I feel it so much. It's, um, I'd say it's overwhelming, but it's not quite, mm -hmm. but oh, wow, well, I just, uh, I just can't believe how much there is in that, you know, um, just every day sort of thing. I, I didn't know whether to put myself in to see someone because I kept bursting into tears sort of thing. But I also sort of... <laughs> I feel all right as well, you know. Yeah. I, I'm just okay. And uh, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. Very good. Very, very good. One of my girlfriends in Hawaii, she, she cries at some point every day and has for years. Now, you might think on hearing that, that is she a gloomy person? Is she a depressed person? Not at all. She's one of the most joyous, beautiful, and her face is so lovely. It's so beautiful. I think it's because she does that every day, actually. Um, and she and I did, she and I did a, a YouTube video years ago. It's, it's, you can find it. It's called um, Boys Don't Cry Enough. <laughs> <laughs> And we had this discussion. We were doing a little webinar, and we had this discussion about the power of that release, you know, that, that our, our system is made to do that. There's actually even uh, calming hormones in tears. Right. Pretty amazing, huh? And, and so, you know, I know that for a man it can seem alarming to have a lot of tears coming through. And maybe it's also phase-specific. Maybe it's a, a phase that is happening right now. But I would just say to surrender to the truth of that and, yeah. and yeah, not I, worry about it. I think um, I, I do cry more than um, your average guy. Um, <laughs> I, I cry when I laugh quite a lot. Yeah, and, I do um, too. My friends used to laugh at me because sometimes when I watch The Simpsons, I'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but I, I never really sort of. But this this crime is much deeper. You know, that sort of real. I, I feel like it's a cleansing, uh, detoxy yes. type of. You know primal sort of thing beautiful yes there is a sense when you've had a good cry like often we we 
things build up. You know, we, we go along and there's, there's little, you know, little wounds that are happening along the way. And we, yeah. you know, we sort of buckle up and, and um, hold it in for a while. But there can come a point when the release is really the healthiest thing. And you can feel it as you're as it's happening. You can feel that this was the appropriate response, yeah. right? And yeah. Mm. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah beautiful. And I encourage, I, I do encourage men because you've been so trained from such a young age to not cry. Um, and, you know, called a sissy and a crybaby and, you know, all those things that, that are indoctrinated. Um, and it's a lot of holding in. It's a lot of stuffing of emotion over a course of a lifetime. So I encourage not that you have to, you know, cry as much as my girlfriend in Hawaii, but, but, um, but that there are times when tears are the, the most obvious response, you know. Yeah, I give myself full permission for that, and it happens frequently. Yeah. Punchi Punchi was good about that. He would he would cry, and then laugh in the same satsang, you know. But it was there's a freedom in it, you know. And also, when, when you're in that space of crying, sometimes you can feel how free it feels, and you don't want to alarm somebody else. You know, you want to sort of just say, it's really okay, I'm just crying. <laughs> you know? Because that's the other thing. When we see someone crying, we, we put a big tragedy on it, you know. But it doesn't really have to be that. So today, when I heard about my friend and I saw the photos, you know, I was, I was watching, I was looking at it with tears in my eyes. I didn't really have a full-blown cry because he, he had been ill. So there was a way in which there's a preparation that goes on when you know someone's headed toward the end. There's a, there's a silent preparation that's going on without you even trying. But... Uh, still there's a difference when that moment comes and uh, you know I, I was I was looking at his photos of him as a younger person and how just all the feelings one has and and uh, and there was just it felt honoring somehow that I was seeing it with tears in my eyes you know it just felt like this is an honoring of my feelings for this friend what's been coming up for me that this man who betrayed me and my finances and after the last Dharma dialogue I think on Sunday I think, I think it was then there was something about all those feelings that we hold in the against others that we create suffering in ourselves and you know it'll just come with a blast <laughs> similar in your, your theme you know of like just so angry at him and in disbelief that he's left me in such a vulnerable financial position um, and I'm quite stuck with it I don't know you know, I want to kind of accept it and I'm doing everything I can. But I'm still stuck in that suffering with... Um, um, because I'm stuck in the situation, which, which may be the situation until I die or I may resolve something, but... I'm wondering how to resolve some of this this suffering in it. Mm -hmm. And you know, kind of try to accept it and but I feel like I'm uh, forcing it or pretending 
pretending to myself. It's um, accepting what is. This one's hard for me to accept. Okay, well, there's another kind of acceptance you could come to, which is you have these feelings, you have these feelings of of you know strong uh, agitation and anger. Um, so, because the situation is kind of ongoing, the, they're getting triggered. You know, you're having to deal with the material a lot, and so can there be an acceptance of your self in this situation that you're experiencing this? anger now and again, not all day long, but now and again, and just try your best to also put in your life, sprinkle in your life, gratitude wherever you can. You don't have to get rid of the other, let it be there when it comes, but just direct your attention, use your attention and your ability to direct your attention into this other sweet spot. It's kind of like a balance. Yes. It's kind of like a, 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 definitely a balancing so that you're not just at the mercy of wherever your mind is flitting about and it keeps landing on the the sore, you know. And there is a lot of self-blame there. And that, I think you can use some discernment uh, to alleviate some of that sorrow. Um... You know, we've talked about it before. I think that, that you know, it's so not fair to yourself, you know, when, when someone cheated you and lied and stole. It's unnecessary then to blame yourself. It's that you, you just were unlucky. You ran into someone who did this. They're out there. Right. They're out there. Yeah. There are a lot of them. And people with money, often those kind of people go for people with money. Everyone I know who has money is dealing with people are trying to get their money. <laughs> somehow. They they see them like a slot machine. Like you just pull the lever or somehow you're gonna get the change roll rolling out, you know, and 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 some of the most wonderful, smart, hip people, right, who who get taken. Because people are good at those jobs. They're, they're good at those con jobs, you know. So yeah. it's obviously, uh, you know, from my point of view, somebody whose behavior is doing that, is there, there's some sort of sociopathy going on, Right. Some way that I don't know how they sleep at night, but they do. So sociopaths yeah. can sleep at night. They don't feel it. Yeah. So it's just unlucky, you know. Just that unlucky. They're out there. What is the? That's the. There's a book, The Sociopath Next Door. I think they say t- one in twenty-five people. <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean that they're out murdering or anything. It just means that they don't have the capacity for empathy. And so they just don't have empathy. Um, So, you know, that extra suffering, you can just really use your discernment to just say, no, I'm not going to suffer that one. That was just an unlucky draw, you know. We all have unlucky draws in life. You had a big, huge lucky draw, by the way, with inheriting money. True. (laughs) Yeah? A lot of people didn't inherit money and they have to work every day for food. And then, as you heard me say the other day, there's all these famines going on right now. 30 or 40 million people in famine... And you can only also imagine, we don't really have to imagine far, because you can just look into the news a bit. Um, A famine isn't just happening peacefully. In those circumstances, terrible things are going on with the famine, right? So you have been incredibly fortunate 
You're just not now as fortunate as you thought you were going to be. <laughs> so why is it, you know, that... that <laughs> why is it, you know, that line of we don't know what we've got or we don't value what we've got till we've lost it, whether it's love or money or anything else? Well, and that's another thing that one can start to retrain the awareness that... You know, that you can start to retrain your uh, habit into gratitude, right? And it does take a little bit of intention, it does, you know, but actually it's very possible. You can make, you hear me say it all the time, you can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. That it's all to how you're framing it. And, yeah. and some days are heaven and some days are hell. Yeah. But also, some days you're in heaven and you're making it hell. Yeah. Right? And some days you might be in a kind of hell and you're making it heaven. Yeah, true. You know? So, it's all how you're using your attention. And I, I'm not saying that those feelings, those really strong feelings, we don't have to eradicate them, right? But you can start to subsume them. Right, with other feelings and other ways of seeing it. And you just sort of, it's like, you know, you're sort of putting little flashes of light into the dark picture, right? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I spoke last week on, on Sunday and you were there about that. Six days ago, I was at a memorial of a friend. And um, during the memorial, I had this very profound release that was happening that had to do with a kind of crusting in my heart around what I perceive as human stupidity and ignorance that is killing much of life on earth. And I, I, you know, I had just gotten to a point and I'm kind of saturated in that news because I study climate science and, you know, I'm just paying attention to all of this information. And I had started to feel this buildup of, of real agitation and of like just being sick of this species, <laughs> you know. And so I, I could feel how... Standing there as this release was happening, I was it was being released into just this quiet, also, okay, this is how it is. And it's it's not I don't I don't see it as evil, I just see it as ignorant. But I was even agitated and resisting the ignorance to some degree, you know, and and I I had this very deep experience watching the images of my friend. Um, of her life passed by on that screen that I was watching at the memorial. And it wasn't so much about her that I was having this feeling, these feelings come over me. It was really about, you know, this is how it is. You know, whatever it is, this it's rolling out as it is. And... So it was this deep, it was much more a deep surrender. It doesn't mean one doesn't do what you can in your personal case, do what you can to get justice and get if you can get anything back, go for it. Um, but it's it's the recognition of you do what you can and then you you release it. I was just um, wondering if you could talk to us about intuition, you know, our sixth sense. Intuition. <laughs> I did talk about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it basically has to do, in my view, uh, with the kind of sensitivity that comes when your awareness is unclouded. So when your awareness is unclouded, 
it's picking up a lot of information without you trying. And what we often call intuition really is that your your um, insight and your and your perception is being informed with a lot of information. So when you, you know, when you're with people who seem highly intuitive, it's probably that there's been a kind of you know a kind of processing under the radar of a lot of information. And then there's a there's an an impulse or an instinct or an intuition that's very strong. I don't see anything magical about it. And I think some people are just more inclined to use their information that way, you know. Some people are very affirmed, like they they have an impulse or an intuition of, about something, and it all works out well. And so there's a certain confidence that comes, and they're affirmed in it. So they tend to practice it more, you could say. Yeah, it's sort of like if I feel I'm doing something, but I don't want to be doing it. And I Take sometimes, it. if I'm doing something and I have a bad feeling about it or mm-hmm. something, and then it just is really hard. But if I'm doing something and it feels really good yes. to be doing that thing. Yeah. And I, I don't really know why, but, it, you know, whatever I'm doing, it feels really good to do that thing. Then I feel like I, I can trust my intuition in a way. I yeah. Don't know. Sure. Because there's been a lot of subliminal information that is going on in the process that is giving you the, the signals that this is, this is good, this feels good. Mm. Right. But sometimes we know the intuition can tell us, you know, caution, beware. Because some other circumstance perhaps where you've recorded that information... Maybe you can't even call it up exactly in memory right now, but you feel you you somehow knew it, and so there's a, a kind of a caution that arises. So it's another reason why this spacious awareness that we're pointing to is so powerful. It's so it's so uh, it. It helps in all aspects of life. It helps in difficult times. It helps in relationship. It helps in creativity, intuition as to what to do next or how to respond to something. Um, Helps in times of loss. All of it, the whole gamut. You don't have to even know anything particularly. You, You just keep relying. You keep resting. That's the great... Um, you know, open secret really is that you keep tuning into the resting and the ease and you rely on that to guide you. Often we over-employ our minds, right? We, we want to figure things out and we want to have a formula and we want to have a philosophy and, you know, it's really contraindicated it's the other direction it's into deep quiet right open space letting the stories not fighting with the story that it arises but letting it go by that's another thing people get fascinated with their stories and even if the story is difficult, right? Um, they just get locked into it and, the, and there's this habit of just telling it over and over again. Yeah. So uh, there can be another way, another habit that starts to ensue where you're, you're just not telling the story. You're just not... If it's arising, it's so quietly arising. It's not, you're not interested in it, you know. So it's kind of like some background noise occasionally, but you're just not locked in it anymore. (laughs) 
Hello, dear. Hello. <laughs> when I was uh, just a little kid, I heard from somewhere, I'm not sure where, um, a quote from Buddha, um, and it was something along the lines of... Um, like attachment to any particular outcome is is pretty much the root of all unhappiness. Um, and yeah, I just sort of I heard it and remembered it, but it never really sort of sunk in until recently. Um, and yeah, I've just sort of been practicing sort of <clears throat> not attaching myself to any particular sort of outcome and not sort of buying into those stories, just like we were talking about. And, yeah, I just sort of, I've just been feeling this this sort of incredible weight off my shoulders almost. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, it's like, it's like when I sort of um, imagine this in the future, that in the future, or the, the imagine things that I should be doing or not doing, or et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a bit like... Um, it's a bit like there's an expectation within me to live up to, to those stories and be this person and be that person. But when I just don't think about that and don't, don't invest in that, it sort of makes life a whole lot easier and yeah. it just sort of goes really effort, effort, effortlessly. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah. It affects the, it actually affects the outcome when you're not trying to make it be a certain way. How yeah, so? It, it, it affects it in a nice way. <laughs> often, not always, but it, it often does. It's when you're just sort of going with the flow. Um, things sort of go a little bit easier usually. Oh, yeah. It's a whole lot easier when yeah. you just go with the flow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't really have a question. I just sort of wanted to share yeah. my personal journey, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You pointed to the um, Buddha's um, second noble truth, the truth of attachment. Um, the first noble truth being the truth of suffering and unsatisfactoriness. Um, the second noble truth is the truth of attachment being the root cause. Now, I liked your frame on it because you said attachment to the outcome. A lot of people, when they hear attachment being the cause of suffering, they think they shouldn't feel attached to anything. And that's actually very hard as a human being. Um, to not feel bonded with those we love. Mm. Um, and so that's not something I recommend. I, I think we are bonded. There's nothing we can really do about it. And I see it also as beautiful. Um, it's part of being, it's part of the human experience. And, um, and it just does come with the vulnerability to loss. But that's the price you pay for loving and better to have loved and lost. Um, <laughs> and um, that's just the price you pay. So, you know, I, I, I'd like to make that distinction mm. about mm. attachment because I, for many years, as a practicing Buddhist, for many, many, many years, we were enjoined to not... Uh, to try to dim feelings of attachment. We were trying to eradicate them. And I, I, something in me always rebelled about that. I always knew how sort of ridiculous that was. And I always could feel that there was a, it would require a complete shutting down, a numbing of sorts, you know. Surely the attachment we feel to one another as human beings is probably one of the most valuable things that we have. I agree. I agree. And I think that the more we feel that, the the safer we are. The more we feel that, the more we feel that about the living world, right? If everyone felt that way, which they don't and probably won't, <laughs> um, but we would be in a lot better shape than we are, you know. But unfortunately... Many people's relationship to the living world and even to other beings is mercenary. 
It's like they're just, it's just product to be used. And so what we're speaking about right now in this moment here in this conversation is the, the true celebration in the heart. That another thing that I, I read about and think about a lot is what one of the people I read, he has a book called The Myth of Human Supremacy. And I also do not see humans as the supreme being on the planet at all. I even think we are not such a great <laughs> representation of a species given how much we're slaughtering on the planet. And so um, to really kind of, you know, realize that this open-heartedness and this, this bonding is applicable to all the living creatures, you know. We're not so great, right? We like some of us, but... <laughs> but there's this myth of supremacy about humans, like, as though we should just have the right to just stomp around and kill everything in sight for our use. Right, and there's also the myth of, like... Um individual supremacy as well yes, like I'm course. better than all the other humans yes. yeah of course yeah right yeah yeah no these are the these are the fallacies that are toxic to life and so yes the the whole question of attachment and bonding and relational experience and the the self unto self and the tenderness and delicacy that that Delicateness that that produces in how you behave, you know, to my way of seeing, this is this is the highest good. So yes, very 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 much agree. And at the same time, about attachment to outcome and about attachment to our productions of life in terms of. We want certain things to go a certain way and so on. If you're battling that battle, it's, it's kind of a losing battle. Yeah, yeah. I've been fast realizing that. It's, yeah, yeah. Well, good. You're lucky to be seeing that at your young age. You know, you're really lucky to be seeing that. Mm, mm. Beautiful. This has been In the Deep. You can find the entire list of In the Deep podcasts at katherineingram.com, where you can also book a private session by phone or Skype, see the schedule for Dharma Dialogues and Retreats, or make a tax-deductible donation in support of this work. Till next time.